This will be the next episode for the biblical hunt for a virtuous woman. And we've made it to Sarah. Sarah is Abraham's wife. Her name was Sarai. Had her name changed to Sarah, but she's a very good woman. And something about her is she stayed right even when she wasn't getting what she wanted. It says in Genesis eleven twenty nine, And Abram, which is Abraham, and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. So, obviously she really wanted a child, but she didn't get one for a very long time. And during that time, she stayed right even when she didn't get what she wanted. That is a sign of a virtuous woman. You know, just like Paul said, he, he learned in whatsoever state he was in, therewith to be content. He said, be content with such things as you have. And there are six women that had miracle births in the Old Testament. Sarah... Sarah is one of them. Then you got Rachel and Rebecca, and you got Hannah and Manoah's wife and the great woman of Shunem. And these actually picture Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had a miracle birth with the virgin birth. So that's seven miracle births, Jesus Christ being the seventh, the number of perfection. And Sarah went through this hard time. But then she gets to be a picture of Mary and Jesus. Sarah and Isaac picture Mary and Jesus. So you, she went through this hard time to be an example. Maybe the Lord's putting you through a hard time to be an example. <clears throat> so Sarai is barren. She had no child. She's serving God even though she isn't getting what she wants when she wants it. I have kids, and a lot of times kids cry when they don't get what they want, when they want it. But if you want something and you believe it would please the Lord for you to have it, then you should just pray for it and live right until you get it. Don't cry about it. Don't just give up and cry about it. Pray to God about it. Maybe you can't have children. Or you have been unable to have children. Having children doesn't make you any more spiritual. And it doesn't just mean God's punishing you if you can't have one. But if you want children and you can't have them, just keep praying that you'll have one. And even if he doesn't give you one, I believe you'll be rewarded for staying in consistent prayer for a good thing. And maybe the Lord is using this circumstance to keep you close to him. Or for some unknown reason you can't see because you don't have his foreknowledge. But Sarai, Sarai, Sarah, she stayed right even when things weren't going her way. Sarah went with Abram to a strange country. In Genesis twelve five, it says, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and to the land of Canaan they came. You know, Sarai could have pitched a fit and begged for Abram to stay and not follow the Lord. God told him to go to this whole other place that he wasn't even familiar with, that she wasn't familiar with. You know, she could have pitched a fit. She could have said, I'm staying, I'm not going. But she's a virtuous woman. And it even commends her in 1 Peter 3, 5 through 6. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So it says she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. 
Now, this doesn't mean obeying your husband, even when he's wrong. But by going along with Abraham and going to a strange place, she would have been also following God's instructions because God's the one that told him to do it. So you see, when your husband tells you to do something that's right and it goes along with the Bible, it's not that you're just obeying your husband. You're obeying the Lord too. And the way to know that that that's what the Lord wants you to do is you have to read the Bible yourself as well. Now, Sarah even obeyed Abraham when she shouldn't have. In Genesis 12, 10 through 11, it says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Sarai, even up in age, would have been attractive to the Egyptians. So Abram is worried sick that the Egyptians are going to kill him and take her. So he has her tell a lie. It says in Genesis 12, 12, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they, shall, but they will save thee alive. You, I believe here, Abram should have just trusted in God more. And that's easy to say, because I'm not in his shoes here, but I think it's safe to say Abram should have trusted in God just as he does later on when he saves Lot and goes against the five armies. But he caused Sarah not to trust God here as well. And I'm not sure why Abram doesn't have the courage here as he does later on. Maybe he has a growth in the Lord that happened between chapters 12 and 17, but Abram should have trusted in God. And if they trust, and if they trust in God, they wouldn't have gotten this situation. And if the Egyptians wanted to take Sarai, they would have just had to pry him out of his cold, dead fingers. And Abraham and God would have been the majority. God would have intervened. Instead, he tells Sarai to tell a half truth, which is still a lie. He says in Genesis 12:13. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now here, Sarai doesn't have to obey her husband because he's telling her to do something wrong. You see, you don't blindly just follow anybody and do everything they say if they're telling you to do something wrong. You know, we all have got authority figures in our life. I've got a supervisor, police officers, I've got a pastor. We've got all kinds of, you know, authority figures. But I don't do what they say if they're telling me to go against the Scriptures. You know, Acts 5.29 says we ought to obey God rather than men. So if you, if you have a virtuous woman, then she does obey her husband, but she doesn't have to just blindly follow everything he says, you see. You know, being a virtuous woman doesn't mean, you know, you know, your husband tells you to do something really sinful, like get drunk with him, all these things. That doesn't make you a virtuous woman going along with that. And it doesn't make you not a virtuous woman if you don't obey him in those ways because he's telling you to do something wrong. But Abram... He should have, I think he should have fought for here. If you have a virtuous woman, then she's worth fighting for. The Lord Jesus laid down his life for his bride. And I'm very unconfrontational. But when a guy flirts with my wife, it's like I, I turn into this whole other guy. I think Abram should have turned into this whole other guy right here. And just trusted the Lord. And said, you can have her when you prior out of my cold dead fingers you know a man should get jealous over his wife contrary to what the lord what the world says jealousy 
is a good thing, contrary to what the world says it is. Exodus 34, 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. You see, God's jealous. He gets jealous over us when we go after idols. He gets jealous for Israel when they, when they went after idols. You'll find that most times when you approach the man who's trying to take your wife, that he always backs down. Always. Almost always. Abram should have made out with Sarai right in public for all the Egyptians to see it. And if they wanted to fight, Abram should have just said, let's fight. Because some things are worth fighting for. He shouldn't have acted like it was his sister. If Sarai is a virtuous woman, she's worth fighting for. He might not find another good one. What does it say? Proverbs 12, 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. If the Egyptians take Sarai, that's like somebody taking Abram's crown. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. You know, there's all kinds of crowns in the Bible, and I think the devil would like to take every crown that you've got, even your wife, you know, Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Don't let the devil take any crown that you've got. You think back about Adam and Eve. Adam had the crown for the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, and the crown for the kingdom of heaven. He'd been given dominion over everything, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. He had the world's first virtuous woman, a crown to her husband. So the first Adam had many crowns, like the Lord has, but the devil took all the first Adam's crowns. But he won't take the Lord's crowns. You see, the devil gave him a crown of thorns, but that was to get his bride. Another crown for him. So he willingly took the crown of thorns. Israel is the father's bride, and he's coming back to fight for Israel. Some things are worth fighting for. He should have just went ahead and fought for Sarah. If he dies, he dies. That's the way his attitude should have been. And of course, you know, I'm not in his shoes. It's easy for me to say that. But Proverbs 31, 10 through 11, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. She's worth fighting for. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Perhaps Abram trusted Sarai so much that he didn't think she would do anything with the Egyptians. But you don't want to put your wife in that temptation. In Genesis twelve fourteen it says, And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. So Sarai looked good for her age. Most times a virtuous woman looks good for her age. You know why? Because in Proverbs 16, 31, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. You know, <clears throat> don't feel bad about having white hair, gray hair, if you've lived your life in righteousness. A woman who's lived for the Lord will mostly have a beautiful countenance. And you can tell someone has done some hard, sinful living because their face witnesses against them. The show of their countenance will witness against them. And they may be 30, but they look 50. They may be 50, but they look 70. But the virtuous woman, the woman that's lived for the Lord most of her life, she has a beautiful countenance usually. And maybe you're a woman that did do hard living throughout your life, just hard, sinful living. But now maybe you're up in age and you've, maybe you just got saved and you're living for the Lord now. But you still got the scars of that sinful life, whatever they may be. Don't let that discourage you because God sees your soul as righteous as Jesus Christ. He's not looking at the flesh anyway. It's man that looks at the flesh. 
Man looks on the outward things. The Lord looks at the heart. But usually, a woman that's lived for the Lord their whole life and that's living for the Lord in their old age, they usually have a beautiful countenance. Maybe then they obviously don't look like they did when they were younger, but they still have a beautiful countenance because the, you can tell by the countenance many times a virtuous woman in uh, Genesis twelve fifteen, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house that's when you say okay you can have her after you pry her out of my cold dead fingers I think that's what Abram should have said easy for me to say but I think Abram should have just put his foot down and said, no, you're not taking her to Pharaoh's house. She's staying in my house. And then he can turn into like Jet Li and Jackie Chan and Chuck Norris and John claude and Sylvester Stallone and just go Rambo on them. Abraham and God would have been the majority. God has showed out in harder circumstances. God shows out in harder circumstances for Abraham later. He should have just went ahead and put his foot down and said, no, she's staying with me. And if you don't like it, let's fight. And in Genesis twelve sixteen, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Pharaoh gave Abram a bunch of stuff for Sarai's sake. He should have told Pharaoh like he tells the king of Sodom later on, and said, Pharaoh, I don't want your stuff, and you need to keep your ugly fingers off my wife. He should have said to Pharaoh that he's not going to take from him a thread or a shoe latchet, just like he told the king of Sodom. Remember, a virtuous woman is worth far above rubies. All this sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels is not cutting it. There's no price you can pay for her or any even trades. There's no even trades you can do. In Genesis twelve seventeen, it says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So that's how you know God didn't approve. Here he plagues this Pharaoh's house for messing with Abram's wife. Later on, he's going to plague Pharaoh in the book of Exodus for messing with his own wife, Israel. And in Genesis twelve eighteen, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Yeah, Abram, what's the matter with you? Why didn't you tell her? This is your wife. Why didn't you tell him this is your wife? Genesis twelve nineteen. Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to meet a wife. Now behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. See, he's not even doing anything. He's not going to kill him. He's telling him to take his wife and go. See, imagine if he would have got in Pharaoh's face at the start and said, don't even be looking at my wife. You ever caught a guy really eyeing your wife in Walmart or somewhere and he just won't quit staring? I've just stopped walking and, and looked at him, eyeball to eyeball, until he's so awkwarded out and he just put his head down and left. I'm not saying you have to go that far, but I, I worry about people who don't have any jealousy for their spouse at all. They're like, oh, I don't care if they're looking at my wife. I don't care if they flirt with my wife. I don't care if they hang out with my wife. That's weird. There's something wrong there. You ought to have some jealousy for your spouse. But it's like this one guy kept walking in front of the store where me and my wife were working back when we first started. This might have been when we were dating, actually. And he just kept taking a peek after, peek at her over and over, walking in front of the store. 
And I kept looking his way until we locked eyes. And I gave him what I call the stare of death, which most likely isn't as intimidating as I think I'm being because I'm about 5'4", 150 something pounds if I'm eating right. But the look on his face when he made eye contact with me was, was priceless. Most people are cowards and if they're doing wrong, you just confront them and they almost always back down. But yeah, he just left. He he quit taking peeks. And you you really need to <clears throat> fight for your marriage, fight for your, each other, fight for your wife, because the devil can send somebody your spouse's way, charming, smooth talker. So you got to just nip it in the bud right then. And in Genesis 12, 20, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. All Abram probably had to do was stand up to them from the get-go, and the Lord would have taken care of the rest. Now, even great men like Abraham are just that, men. They are flesh. You know, I can sit and critique Abram all day and say he should have done this, and he should have done that, and he should have fought for his wife, but at the same time, there's probably something going on that I don't even know about. And if I was in his shoes and in that moment, I might have done the same thing. But at the same time, there ought to be some fiery jealousy in you that says, by the help of the Lord. There should have been something in him that said, by the help of the Lord, I'll, I'll take you down. You can't have my wife. You can't have Sarai. So the picture is the bride of Christ going out into the world, which is pictured by Egypt in the story. Egypt pictures the world. It pictures the bride of Christ going out in the world and lying about who her husband is. Sarah lied about her husband. And there's probably been times that you lied about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ out of fear. And Genesis 13, 1. It says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. So Sarai had material possessions. But all these material possessions were not worth as much as having a child, and she knew it. Just like other women in the scriptures, she would do anything to have a child. You get over to Genesis 15, 3 through 4, and Abram said, Behold to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. You see, Abram and Sarai were so old that they didn't think they could have children, but the Lord can do the impossible. Genesis fifteen five, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. You know, count the stars like a teller. Count the stars, if thou be able to number them. He said unto him, So shall thy seed be. He said unto Abram to look up at the stars, and the same way you can't count them stars, that's the same way it's going to be with your children. You're going to have so many children, you can't even count them. And that sounds very far-fetched to Abraham, that this old married couple could have a child, you see, imagine the oldest couple in your church or the oldest couple that you know of coming up being with child. Just imagine that. So they didn't believe it too well. And because of impatience, Sarai and Abram don't wait on the Lord and they make it a big mess. In Genesis 16, 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. Sarai, although a virtuous woman, goes to the world for help. Egypt, it's like I said, it's a picture of the world. She has an Egyptian handmaid who helps her and waits on her. And she goes to the world for help. God already told them that Sarai would have a child. But they're trying to rush things up and get it through Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. 
I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Abram messes up again. And here, Sarai messed up again. She didn't want to wait any longer on the Lord. So she wants Abram to have children for her with the Egyptian Hagar. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. Now that's hard for me and you to imagine. We're in completely different culture, completely different all the way around. And to me, this is just weird how this is how they were okay with this, but that's what happened. And it isn't that God is okay with. Abram having more than one wife, you know, just because Abraham and David and Solomon and the Old Testament heroes had more than one wife and did this, it doesn't mean God's okay with it. They did all kinds of stuff that God's not okay with. He wants you to marry one person and cleave to your wife, not wives. He said, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife? And, you know, back in Deuteronomy 17, 17, he didn't want the kings to multiply wives. In 1 Timothy 3, he said the bishop must be the husband of one wife. So, taking another wife always leads to trouble, usually. In 1 Kings 11, Solomon's heart was turned away because of his wives. And he burned incense to their gods. So, just because Abraham does it, don't mean God's okay with it. And if you're a virtuous woman, you need to have some jealousy as well. You know, I think it was, it's, well, I, it's obviously, it was a mistake, Sarai giving Hagar to Abraham. You shouldn't be okay with your husband running around with women that he cl claims are just friends and going out by themselves. 99% of the time, if a man hangs out with another woman that isn't his wife, He's not just friends. He's wanting to be friends with benefits with her. And this woman said, you know, I heard this woman say, she said something like, I don't care if my husband looks as long as he doesn't touch. That's also very not wise at all because if he looks, at a, looks all the time, he's going to end up touching. Just like Achan in the Bible, he... He, what, what, first, what happened first, he saw the goodly Babylonian garment, and then he took it. You know, you look first, and then you take stuff. You know, Jesus said, if a man look on a woman to lust after her, then what happens? He commits adultery with her already in his heart, and as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, a virtuous woman, she needs to have some jealousy in her for her husband. A husband needs to have some jealousy in him as well. A man shouldn't just go around commenting on other women's looks in front of his wife. And it should bother you if he does. And I've, I've heard men comment on other women in front of his wife. And even in front of his son. Setting a hor horrible example for his son. Because then he's going to think, well, it's, it's okay to comment on other women in front of my wife when he gets older. And I think that's just disrespectful. You come in and saying these women are hot walking by in front of your son when you should just be complimenting on his mother. You're teaching him not to respect his mother. You're teaching him not to respect his future wife. And I, I've known, I've seen and heard in my life married couples saying such and such person is hot or this celebrity guy is hot in front of their spouse. And that's just opening doors that you don't want to open. I even heard this couple talking about how they watch pornography together. That's opening a door that you don't want to open. That's just going to lead to you opening another door and then another door. Because sin, it just doesn't stop. It just wants to keep pushing the envelope further and further. In Genesis 16, 4 through 5, it talks about how Abraham goes in into Hagar. 
and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. So she done messed up and she knows it. But a virtuous woman isn't sinless. There is no sinless woman. Contrary to what they say about Mary, she also needed a savior. So take comfort in the fact even a virtuous woman messes up. And then you get over to Genesis 17, 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Both Sarai and Abram laugh at the word of God. Because it, to, to them this sounds so unbelievable. A hundred year old and a ninety year old. Having a child. When you get older, you sometimes lose that childlike faith, but that is the way you have to approach the scriptures. If God keeps, you know, think about it. If God keeps the sun up there and don't let it fall on my head and doesn't let the moon fall on my house and somehow made my heart to just keep beating, how easy would it be for him to put a, a baby in an older lady's body? How easy would it be for God to put a baby in an old woman's body? If he can put the sun and the moon and the stars up there, that sounds a lot easier to put a baby in an old lady's body. Think about your heart. Think about how long you have lived. That thing's been beating for a long time. I think back to when I was a kid and it was beating back then. And now I'm in my 30s and it's still beating. And it never did stop beating. That's amazing. It just keeps going. And if God can do that, he can put a baby in an elderly woman's body. If God made the stars also, and they still burn to this day, is anything too hard for the Lord? You get over to Genesis 18. In verse 9, it says, And they said unto him, the, you know, the Lord came with a couple angels to visit Abraham, and they said unto him, they said to Abraham, you know, where is thou, Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am old, Waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? He says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Sarah lied once again because she was afraid. See, a virtuous woman gets afraid. She tells lies. She messes up big time. This should give you comfort that you can still be considered a virtuous woman even with all your faults that you got. Think about Sarai. She almost shacked up with Pharaoh. She almost cheated on Father Abraham. She gave Hagar to Abraham to be another wife. She didn't wait on the Lord and even laughed at his word. Yet, God still gave her a son, made her the mother of many nations. He commends her through Abraham in Romans 4. He commends her in Hebrews 11. He commends her in 1 Peter. And you probably have messed up, but you probably haven't messed up as bad as Sarai has. And you can still be a virtuous woman. How do you do it? Well, when you fall, just let the Lord pick you up. Let him dust you off and keep going. It's not about being perfect. Being perfect isn't what a virtuous woman is. Being a virtuous woman is about how many times will you get back up after you fall. 
you know, Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. How many times will you get back up after you fall? That's the way to be a virtuous woman. You just keep getting back up. And then you get into Genesis 20, Sarah and Abraham mess up again. Just like me and you, they just keep making a mess. We just mess up and we mess up and we mess up. They even make the same mistake again. And I say they, but I, I believe Abraham is the most responsible. In Genesis 20, verse 2 and through 3, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. There he is calling her, her his sister again. And that's a, a way that you don't want to treat a virtuous woman. You know, a lot of men, they get sick of their wife after a while, even though she's still fair to look upon. It's like they start treating, he starts treating his wife more like a sister than he does a wife. And the flame just goes out. And I even know, I've, I've even heard of some husbands that call their wife sister. And they act like she is his sister as well. But Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah, because he thinks that this is just his sister. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. This used to be my favorite verse. Back when my wife worked at the grocery store and I couldn't keep these filthy animals paws off of her, I just kept saying this verse in my mind when I saw these men, Thou art but a dead man. And I asked my pastor, Pastor Donnie, if it was okay for, for me to get rough with these guys, trying to take my wife. And he said, he told me, a man needs to look out for his wife. I doubt he remembers telling me that. But, so I went and I got rough with him after that. But don't let Abimelech take your wife to his house. Don't let Abimelech take your wife for a ride on his motorcycle. Uh, that motorcycle going around, there's a, uh, <clears throat> there's a motorcycle gang going around here called the Widowmakers. And they specialize in killing men making widows. I guess uh, that's what they claim to do. So they specialize in killing men and making widows. And when I see that on their leather jackets that says Widowmakers, I just think of this verse. Thou art but a dead man. You can't come between uh, a married couple and not be judged for it. You know, some mother-in-laws are kind of widow makers themselves. They end up basically killing their son-in-law with their mouth. And Abimelech, you know, Abimelech, he would have been a dead man if he would have took it a step further. He would have been a dead man if he killed Abraham to get Sarah. If he would have killed Abraham to get Sarah, he would have been a widow maker. He could have joined that widow maker bot game. But he would have been a dead widow maker. Because the Lord said, thou art but a dead man. If he, if he laid with Sarah, he would have been a dead wife stealer. The Lord said, thou art but a dead man. This heathen Abimelech is more righteous than a lot of pastors right here in the Bible Belt. Uh, just in my short time of being saved about 13 years, I've seen pastors uh, flirt with other men's wives at work. And when I saw that, I just the first thing that popped in my mind was that verse, Thou art but a dead man. And I'm glad my wife don't work here. And uh, David, he had to share mercies, or he'd have been a dead man for getting with Uriah's wife. I doubt you'll be so lucky. David was a great man, but I don't trust him with my wife. I love the Psalms. I love the stories about David, but I, he, he can't hang out with my wife. I wouldn't let him come to my house and hang out with her. I wouldn't leave her around him. I love to read the Psalms, but I don't trust them in my wife. But the only reason he didn't die is because he had the sheer mercies of David. He'd have been a dead man. 
God said to Abimelech, Thou art but a dead man. You lay with another man's wife under the law, thou art but a dead man. Um, this verse will keep you from flirting with another man's wife. You got temptations to flirt with another man's wife? You just think of this verse. You're flirting with death. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. You're married, you got your own wife, you got your own husband. Just keep it that way. But this one pastor I seen would flirt with this, with this girl that's half his age, on a third shift, lots of adultery going on in factories. Especially you get into that third shift. Seen a lot of it. He had a wife, he had kids, he had a church. The girl was half his age. I stayed away from him like a plague. You know, I don't want to get I don't want to get hit when he gets struck by the lightning. But at the same time I kept it to myself. I didn't tell nobody. I don't want to ruin his testimony, most likely. The affair the affair never happened, most likely. Even though he was doing it in his heart. But most likely, I'd say he's right with God now and serving God. And if I would have went around telling everybody about what I saw, that would have ruined his testimony. Could have been hurtful to his family, his church. But you don't want to underestimate the flesh. Just because you're this pastor and you think that you're so good, you play around with sin and the flesh, it just keep taking you further and further. In Genesis chapter 20, in verse 4, it says, But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister? And she even herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were so afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham, and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. It's pretty bad when you're getting rebuked by a heathen guy. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou? that thou hast done this thing. And Abram said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So Sarai was his sister. She really was. She, she had the same father, but a different mother. So this goes to show you that even a half-truth is a lie. She really was his sister. But he's leaving out the most important thing. She's also his wife too. But time went on, and God gave Sarah a son, Isaac, which the name means laughter, and God has a sense of humor because they both laugh, so they name him Isaac. In Genesis 21, 6 through 7, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Get over to Genesis 23, 1 through 2, And Sarah was an hundred and seven and twenty years old, 127 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in... Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron, and the land of Canaan, and Abram, Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. 
So Sarah had a long life. Didn't live as long as Abraham, but she had a long life. She got a son in her old age. And it, the Lord commends her in Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She had a great thing happen in her old age. Maybe you're a woman and you're up in age and you think that you're done past being able to do anything for the Lord, done past being able to have anything good happen. Well, Sarah had something really good happen in her old age. You seek the Lord and you try your best to please the Lord and you can do great things for the Lord even in your old age. Sarah, she messed up a lot in her life as we all do. But I still consider her a virtuous woman. Virtuous woman doesn't mean you're a perfect, as in not ever messing up. It's how many times do you get back up after you mess up. 